Good morning. You are very welcome to this morning's Euractiv virtual conference. Today we're talking about EU policies for healthy food environments and asking what is the role for stakeholders. Now we have a great panel lined up for you. You can ask your questions using the ask button. Please try and keep your questions concise and clear. And if they're for a specific panelist, do indicate that as well. Or if it's for the entire panel, let me know and we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. You can also tweet along or share on social media using the hashtag EADebates. Now, at the moment, we're in the midst of this COVID pandemic and it has really brought home to people how important healthy food is, particularly with rising obesity epidemics and the fact that that seemed to have played a part indeed in the COVID crisis. So we'll be looking at that, we'll be looking at what should the outcomes be, what should the European Union be doing and asking how we get there. So do stay tuned for all of that. And with that, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. We have joining from the European Parliament, Christine Schneider, who is a member of the Envy Committee and a substitute on the Agri Committee as well. From BEOC, the consumer organization, we have Emma Calvert, who is Senior Food Policy Officer. Valentina Noli is the Head of Quality Assurance at Own Brand Food of Metro. And Anne Robin is Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Exercise and Sports at the University of Copenhagen. And last but not least, Stinika Unama is the Executive Secretary of UN Nutrition. Thank you so much for joining us today. What we will do, ladies, is I think we'll just go around and ask everyone to give me opening statements, introduce me to yourself and to what you're working on. Christine, let me start with you. Let's have your opening statement. Gentlemen, as the EPP Shadow Rapporteur on the Farm to Fork strategy, I'm very much welcome you to this conference today. The Farm to Fork strategy marks the beginning of a progress aiming to fundamentally change the way of EU agriculture operators and food is pro used for provide to EU consumers. Creating a healthier food environment is one of the main goals of the farm to fork strategy. Having healthy food available, all affordable, allows people to make healthier food choices. When healthy foods are not available, people may settle food for higher in calories and lower in neutral, nutritional value. This show how important it is to create a support uh, healthy food and how can we reach this? We uh, need to increase access to healthier food and beverages, and we need to support the improvement of the quality, variety and amount of healthier foods and beverage in shops, restaurants and canteens. And we need a stronger promote healthier food and beverage to consumers. One way is uh, better labeling of our products regarding nutrition or origin. And for me, it's very important that we make uh, that we take now the right steps toward, towards to a healthier food environment. We will only be able to reach these goals in stakeholders are getting involved and the consumer needs to play a key role when we want to be successful. I'm looking forward for a very interesting exchange and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much as well indeed and we will of course be talking about the farm to fork strategy. Stineke, let me turn to you next. Give me your opening thoughts. Introduce a little bit about the work you're doing at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, maybe two words about UN Nutrition. UN Nutrition is its one coordinating mechanism for the UN for nutrition. We work really towards policy coherence, coherence and coherent programming for nutrition at both global and, and country levels. It's one UN voice for nutrition. So let me go to the, the, the topic of this uh, meeting, food environments. Well, food environments basically is where people meet the food system. So that's where it happens, where people make their choices. Of course, it's influenced by, you know, the supply of food uh, and therefore the availability, prices, affordability, convenience, food access. Uh, so the food production, the processing of the food, the food supply, the distribution of the food and the trade all influence what is available in the food environment. 
But what then people buy in the end depends on, on affordability, but also how convenient the food is, um, how desirable the food is. And I believe that the food industry can help there a lot. Um, it can help uh, by making more healthier uh, foods available through food processing and food reformulation, but it can also help by um, um, a different place in supermarkets, where do you place the food? Um, how do you market? How do you package it? And the former speaker already said it. What about the labeling? How can you promote those foods with better ingredients through labeling? Um, food reformulation, I mentioned that that's of course essential, more of the better nutrients and less of the, the, the not so good uh, nutrients, um, like for example, sugar and, and saturated fats. Um, there is, of course, something about food uh, ingredients, um, and I believe they have a less important play to, to, to role to play. Healthy diets are composed of food, and, and healthy diets, the definition includes, you know, that it contributes to healthy growth, that it has plenty of fruits and vegetables, moderated amounts of, of red meat, etc. It doesn't say that much about, about actual ingredients. So we have to be very careful about that, also with certain uh, ingredients as being healthy or less healthy. Um, um, if you allow me, Chair, I'd like to say a few words about food-based dietary guidelines, because I believe that is an essential tool to help consumers, but also producers and processors to make available uh, and to promote those products that are part of a, of a healthy, healthy diet. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. I have a, a few more topics to, uh, to mention, but that might be better for a next round. Okay, thank you very much. Emma, let me turn to you. Give us the consumer's perspective. Yes, um, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, first of all, I'd just like to introduce Bayek. Uh, we are the European Consumer Organization and we represent 46 independent national consumer organizations across 32 European countries. Um, and in the food team at Bayek, um, a lot of our work really touches upon um, food environments and, and trying to improve food environments to make the healthier choice. Uh, the easier choice for consumers, which we know is uh, very often, too often, uh, not the case uh, for consumers today. So we really welcome that this concept of uh, food environments has become uh, much more mainstream in recent years. Um, as was mentioned already, uh, the farm to fork strategy uh, explicitly mentions food environments as an important uh, tool or important concept to consider when trying to make those uh, choices healthier for consumers. I think that the key to um, food environments is the recognition that there are multiple different pressures on consumers uh, which can lead them towards uh, unhealthier um, choices and the choices that we make are significantly shaped by uh, the context um, within which uh, we, we make those, those choices. Um, so we know today that um, obesity levels are extremely high. We have one in two adults who are already overweight or obese and very worryingly we have one in three children who are overweight or obese and who are much more likely now to have um, to be affected by the non-communicable diseases associated with these conditions. Um, so we really have a great uh, scope and a great opportunity in another way to, to tackle this obesity crisis and, because we know that not one single issue um, has caused these high levels. And I think that's really important to underline that with the food environment concept, that there is no, uh, no panacea, there is no one uh, policy tool which will be the silver bullet to, to tackle all these issues. Uh, sometimes um, I've seen in discussions about um, a certain food policy tool that they are attacked or criticized because they, they don't solve um, obesity levels or they don't reduce obesity levels immediately um, and we have to make sure that we don't 
place the burden of fixing the food system on, on one particular uh, policy tool. So we need to not just look at front of pack nutrition labelling, we need to look at um, availability, uh, affordability, marketing. Uh, there's great scope to do a lot more on um, and uh, reformulation, as has already been mentioned, um, and not uh, to forget uh, retail environments, which can often be um, very unhealthy uh, for consumers. So I look forward to uh, discussing this and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Valentina. Um, actually, Metro is a, a company which is really contributing to um, to provide a sustainable uh, supply chain by looking at each step of the supply chain and by uh, offering to to the customer a wider range of uh, products. And uh, indeed, uh, Metro is uh, committed and uh, following really um, concrete uh, objectives in the area of uh, sustainable food, but not only. And uh, actually, we are really um, uh, working in, in the area of reformulate, reformulation and uh, organic uh, range by extending our range of organic uh, food. Uh, but not only, also focus on, on food waste, um, sustainable fish and seafood, uh, palm oil, sustainable palm oil, uh, soy, and uh, many other uh, positions and policy in the area of sustainability. So when it comes to um, healthier products, um, as I said, we are definitely working in providing an, uh, an offer for the customer which is uh, um, healthier and also more sustainable. But on the other hand, so we are the main contributor, contributor on the supply chain. But what is for me uh, also very uh, important in order to uh, success all together in this effort is to um, stimulate and to raise awareness to the to the final demand to the final customers in order to uh, allow him to uh, buy the product so with the reasonable price with the availability and everything that is uh, related to that thank you very much so i'm a professor as mentioned in uh, nutrition and i work with uh, appetite regulation energy intake and obesity body weight regulation and risk factors for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I've been doing that for quite some time and always with the goal to try to find the evidence of the influence, what we eat, how much we eat, and then uh, body weight regulation and risk factors in the long term. And what we have been uh, looking at for, well, already 20 years ago was the role of non-caloric sweeteners versus sugar as a tool to achieve a more healthy and less energy dense diet with less sugar. And we saw then uh, about 20 years ago that 10 weeks at Libertum diet was actually very efficient when you come uh, substituted sugar with non-caloric sweeteners in reducing energy intake and body weight and fat mass in a population of overweight participants. And uh, this was about 20 years as mentioned, but other studies have found the same in meta-analysis and reviews. And still there are many myths and fake facts out there circulating among uh, lay people, among, well, policymakers, probably, but also scientists about the role of those, uh, those uh, non-caloric sweeteners in, in achieving a healthy diet and a body weight healthy diet. So that was actually uh, that was actually quite interesting. But then recently we were lucky to get uh, an EU grant, a large EU grant, Horizon 2020, where I'm co-coordinating together with researchers from the University of Liverpool, and where we are 29 partners from industry, universities, different organisations, and we are looking at the role of those compounds, sweeteners and sweetness enhancers, for achieving health, to reduce obesity to obtain a safe diet, but also in, in the context of sustainability. So that is actually very interesting, I think. And we look forward to get some more data, the evidence that we can really say and inform politicians and policymakers and uh, also, lay, uh, well, the lay people, but also health professionals, how these compounds uh, really can help achieving a, a healthy and sustainable diet also in the long term. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. For your
Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, well, let's start to uh, ask about what may be the role for industry. Christine, perhaps you could tell me, um, as an MEP, as a policymaker, what sort of input do you need from industry? Um, I think the, the food industry plays, plays really a crucial role to reach a healthier food environment. We need to include all stakeholders along the food supply chain, producers, manufacturers, retailers, and also the, the consumer. We uh, need to, to look at the challenges to find uh, ways for a better contribution. Uh, on the one hand, lacks of transparency across the entire food supply chain. We need to better know and to understand where our food comes from. And this is extremely, I think, for processed food. And food fraud is a direct uh, consequence of the production issue. There's a probably 10 times more olive oil from Italy on the market than the country could actu actually produce. And on, on the other hand, we need food who is affordable for, for everyone. And uh, the producer, the farmer needs to receive a fair income. They need appreciation for their work and they need to appreciate the food. And food waste uh, and food loose needs to be addressed. No farmer wants to bruise for the bin and the supermarket and the supermarkets don't want to uh, throw out food. So the consumer don't want to, to, to spend money on food, which, which is too much. So all, all these thin fields need to be, to be tackled. Many approach can contribute for healthier food environment, I think. Let's turn uh, to Stinica. Same question for you. What's the role of industry? I think in my uh, opening statement, I already mentioned that food reformulation is a key step. If we look at what overall we have been started to eat a lot of, it's, it's processed food and often processed those ingredients that we should see rather see less, like sugar, fats and, and salt. So food reformulation to produce foods that contain less of these harmful ingredients would be really a helpful step. Um, but obviously it's, it's not the only step. So one, you have food reformulation. Two, you have the packaging and the informing of consumers what is in there. So the labeling and, and specifically the front of pack labeling with very clear uh, statements, what is out there. I, I believe in Chile, they have this very clear example of, of um, very clear warnings, what is there and what could be harmful for your health uh, if it has a uh, uh, crossed a, a certain a certain limit. I, I think that is something we could possibly also introduce in the, in the EU, very clear front of pack labeling that is informative to, uh, to consumers. And that also makes it very transparent to consumers to know could this particular product be part of a healthy diet. I'd like to to go back to what I said earlier also to um, always um, be able to link back to a full diet. So it's not one single food that makes up a healthy diet. One single food or product cannot be labeled as being healthy because the diet is healthy and certain products contribute more to a healthy diet than other products. So of healthy diets is extremely important. And then the food industry can support with producing those products or processing those foods that, that, that could, could be part of a healthy, healthy diet. Um, having said that, I, I mentioned the food reformulation. I mentioned the labeling. Uh, packaging is, is part of it, but also the marketing of products. Thank you very much. Valentina, um, from your perspective, what is, obviously industry does have a big role to play, but where do they need to do more? What more should they be done? Give us your perspective. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, food industry definitely play, um, but it's only a small part of the of the supply chain. So the, the role that they have is, of, of course, to uh, produce healthier product. And this is actually um, something that looks, as, as we are now discussing, looks quite easy, but in the end, it's not so easy because we know that um, a food product um, has to be uh, with certain characteristics to be accepted by the, the fi final consumer. So that means having uh, a proper taste, a proper texture, a proper uh, color, for example. So the customers are used to a certain product. And uh, when we go to reformulation, we, we the aim is actually to have the same product, but of course with healthier profile. And so the food industry is, is actually the only stakeholder here that can uh, via research and via, via innovation, uh, find the right uh, formulation of the product which is accepted by the consumer. And then, of course, it, 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 let's say the, the, the next step is, is uh, for example, for retailers or a wholesaler as us to offer and distribute the product uh, across the, the, the countries and to, to allow the customer to, to see the product in, in the store or in the supermarket, to, to visualize it, to see it among other, so among the entire offer that we can find uh, usually in, uh, in stores and, and supermarkets, so to identify the healthier option and to take a decision, to make a choice, to decide whether to go for this product or whether to go for, for some other product. But of course, the, the key part is to find the right uh, formulation for the product to be uh, sold and to be acceptable by, by the customer. And uh, of course, we as a, as a we, we work as a, as a retailer, as a wholesaler, we work closely with producer and we um, actually try to um, support this uh, this way of working so this way of reformulating product or even to create new product to be launched on the market with uh, already with a healthier uh, profile and um, we can only do that by also by engaging the entire organization internally so by raising awareness of this uh, matter and of this all of these topics and uh, as well as outside, so to, to um, communicate to our customers what we are doing, why we are doing it, and um, uh, where we want to go with this uh, huge effort that everybody in the supply chain is actually uh, doing. So that's actually from, from my side. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me remind our audience once again that you can ask questions, use the ask function and write your question in the box there. And also do continue the conversation online using the hashtag EA debates. And let me come to you now and ask where you see the role of industry. We've heard from different, different stakeholders. Well, obviously the industry has a huge role, but I also think they are quite uh, happy to change a lot of things uh, uh, depending on the consumer demands. So the consumer has a huge role as well to change uh, what really is produced by industry. For instance, in Denmark, there's now a big demand for plant-based foods, much bigger supply in the, sh in the shops, in the stores, in the restaurants for such foods that are, that are plant-based or vegetables or vegetarian or whatever. And that's, that's really important, I think, if we want to change what people eat, which I think is the ultimate goal. And price is very important. And there the government is important. And as soon as you change the price on the foods that you want people to eat, then something happens. It's been shown again and again with different uh, fat reduction uh, or, or fat-induced tax or sugar-induced tax. And at some point, there was actually a differentiation in the price on Diet Coke and regular Coke. So the Diet Coke was cheaper and it changed the, the consumers, uh, well, what they purchased. So it's, the government has a huge role, but I think industry really is quite um, willing to change according to consumer demands. So it goes in a, in a circle, you could say. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Emma, perhaps you can pick up on that idea that consumers have power if they, if they want to use it, they vote with their feet. Is that something you see? Um, well, what we often hear is that actually consumers um, maybe have had 
never had so much choice in front of them, but very often it can still feel like there's really only one choice offered to them. Um, and we know that food uh, choices are shaped by many influences beyond um, an individual consumer's control. So relying on, um, on consumers to do the quote unquote right thing, um, it, it hasn't worked in the past. Uh, we have relied on consumer education campaigns um, for many years, decades even, and, and we can see that that hasn't had the impact uh, which, is, which is necessary. So we really need to look at uh, other ways to, to encourage consumers uh, to choose uh, healthier um, choices. And when we talk about the food industry's role, I think it's been mentioned before, it has a, a crucial role to play. Um, what I would say is that um, it's really important that we, we, we cannot rely only on the food industry to do this um, by themselves. Um, what we often see is that there may be some front runners um, who are willing to go that extra step, who so are willing to maybe show a front of pack nutrition label, they're willing to reformulate the products, maybe they're even willing to um, reduce their marketing uh, to children. Um, but because there is no level, level playing field, um, they're less willing to do so because um, their competitors aren't doing so. So we really need uh, public authorities to be um, to be deep in the driving seat to to take uh, responsibility um, for ensuring that uh, consumers can make a healthier uh, choice by enacting uh, regulations. Because so far, when we've seen uh, voluntary codes of conduct or um, voluntary um, pledges, for example, the um, self-regulatory pledge for um, marketing to children, it's uh, unfortunately very weak. Uh, we have the example in France where our member found that um, although the self-regulatory marketing um, pledge found that it was almost 100% compliant, 88% of the products which were advertised to children were either Nutri-Score D or E. So there's um, a, a big area there that we can we can really uh, improve. So we would really like to see um, the food industry move where they can, but also for that to be backed up by action from uh, public authorities. Well, thank you. Um, Stineke, let me ask you a, a very specific question about the role of different food ingredients, such as low or no calorie sweeteners, and what sort of a role they could play in having a sustainably healthy diet. Thank you for that question. I believe Anne already alluded a little bit to that question. Um, I, I am not the perfect expert to ask you that, but I, as I mentioned before, I think that food reformulation uh, lowering uh, levels of sugar in certain, for example, sugary-based uh, beverages can help a lot. Um, but I still think that we have to look at the entire diet. And I believe that is where we uh, should really inform consumers about. And at the same time, strengthen consumers so build that consumer power in order to possibly also then change producers to produce different foods but food-based dietary guidelines can at the same time also inform producers what to produce so making that choice for the consumer also easier uh, dietary guidelines need to be pushed through the public channel but of course um, informed by sound and solid uh, scientific evidence, and there, there it's where, where the the ac academic sector comes in. Um, I think that that could really create an enabling and even more level playing field for all producers and consumers, and even even policymakers to to build a food environment that is that is good for uh, producers and for consumers to make their healthier choice. So I'm sorry for evading your question. I'm, I'm being very honest with you, but I believe you really need to look at the entire diet there. Thank you. Uh, Valentina, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, actually, I, I agree with Stinke because um, the fact that, it, of course, we can offer uh, several products with, uh, in this case, for example, we are talking about sugar, reduced sugar. But still, uh, many of the products um, that has a high quantity of sugar are not necessary for our diet. 
and um, therefore um, it's also important to boost the education when uh, we are still young so where we can start to be educated what is really necessary and and what is our uh, maximum intake for example of sugar that we uh, we need to have on a daily basis so um, in general for from our side uh, in terms of sugar this is one of the pillar of our health and nutrition uh, policy uh, 2018 uh, internationally, so globally, but even earlier, if we look at the uh, countries, local countries like, for example, France, uh, we are um, working on reducing uh, sugar in our products, and um, we have already uh, quite some um, amount of products with uh, lower sugar comparing to original uh, recipe. Um, one point, uh, let's say, where we are struggling, I would say, from our side, as we are, as we are a wholesaler, uh, we are actually a partner for professionists and for uh, Oreca customers. And, um, and here it's probably uh, more difficult for us to um, communicate, to engage the, our customers, the professionals, uh, in understanding uh, what we are doing. Uh, nevertheless, we are also working on this part of the of the let's say of of, of the pillar of health and nutrition uh, concept to um, educate or to uh, inform our customer on what we are doing, and uh, as well as uh, working on developing some digital solution which might be useful for the uh, restaurant owner, for example, to inform the. A client who is going to his restaurant and what is let's say the the um, what is uh, ordering what is consuming and um, this would be um, really um, let's say um, helping and really uh, uh, making clear to the final customer in any countries where he is going to buy the product uh, what is the labeling scheme that has been used and how to read it and how to um, yeah, utilize it. So the point is that the, the consumer needs really to be educated also in understanding what is provided on the product, on the labeling. Otherwise, the risk is to have perhaps uh, several um, information on the label, but um, the message is not transferred to the final uh, customer. Thank you. Emma, perhaps I could also have your thoughts um, on, on different sorts of options available to consumers. Yeah, um, well, I think just to go back to the, the sort of the topic about reformulation, um, we have seen many food manufacturers opting for these um, low calorie sweeteners um, as a, a means to reformulate some of their, their products. Where we would have uh, concerns about the use of um, sweeteners would be with the fact that um, they don't change uh, the sweet sweetness level. So the taste preference uh, for sweeter products is still maintained. Um, and we know that there are many products with very, very high levels of sugar in them, especially um, children's products as well, which have um, or which are very, very sugary. And we know that children are innately um, attracted to the, the sugary taste. So for us, we would really like to see um, a reduction, not just in, in sugar, but also in this taste to try and avoid um, setting in stone taste preferences from an early age for, for more sugary uh, products. Um, what we see sometimes is that uh, food producers may prefer to create new lower calorie um, versions of their original product um, using sweeteners but very often unfortunately they don't touch the original recipe uh, which tends to be the best seller and the highest contributor to um, sugar consumption in their portfolio so we would really like to see um, food producers gradually reducing sugar um, especially in their best sellers where they might have the uh, most meaningful impact uh, on on healthier choices Thank you very much, Emma. I'm seeing quite a few comments coming in from our audience there. Uh, some pointing out that it's a lifestyle that's healthy, not specifically a diet or a food. Others saying, how do we change the entire landscape so that the consumer can only buy healthy food? Um, it's possibly quite an extreme way to go about it. 
But Christine, another point has also been raised regarding purchase decisions and how people can be encouraged to make healthy choices, given that there's a sort of anti-science sentiment at the moment. So I'd like to ask you, what is the best way to include science or, or, or you know, expert opinion in helping people to make these choices? Um. On the one hand, we have uh, uh, to look really clear what science says to us, that we don't uh, take decision out of the stomach. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important to look uh, what science said about food ingredients, what science uh, said about uh, uh, how dangerous it is, uh, for example, uh, to eat too much uh, uh, sugar. And on the other hand, uh, we have to recognize uh, that one hand is what we eat every day, but uh, for really a healthy diet and really healthy lifestyle, well, we need um, uh, to make sports. Uh, it's, it's, it's very important uh, that uh, we, we move. And I think now in the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we all see it uh, the, the whole time we sit here in front at our desk in front of the, the screen, we, we, we don't have too much uh, sport, too much movement. Um, and I think on the one hand, it's very important what look what science said about uh, different food ingredients, but on the other hand, also what they say about our complete lifestyle. So only a, a diet cannot solve really our problems that we have with over obesity and all the the illness about the the, the wrong uh, lifestyle i think uh, we have to look really clear in all these points thank you thank you and i'd like to get your thoughts on the importance of using expert opinion and, and scientific advice in a way that's understandable to consumers Yes, that is, of course, very important, but I don't think we can go direct. We can go directly to the consumers, of course, but it has to go through more official bodies if it has to have a great impact. So, so that the policy makers and the, well, public health professionals and journalists are really important. And if uh, there is a general trend, I think that journalists pick up the bad stories or the, the more, um, the stories that, that give rise to more, uh, you could say, surprise. So they don't pick up, for instance, if you, we publish or someone publish a, a, a nice paper where they show that there's no difference if you consume, for instance, sugar or non-caloric sweetened foods and drinks in relation to, let me just say, breast cancer. There was a recent paper on that. So that's not picked up by journalists, but they pick it up if there's a we, if there's some difference and if it goes in direction of, of something being bad, like non-caloric sweetness, which has been claimed to, to have these uh, strange effects for or unhealthy effects for, for many years, and the science is really not supporting those uh, myths and claims. So there's a, there's a big role for scientists, but they, there's also a big, big role for the people who convey the messages from the scientists to the public. Um, Valentina, um... Perhaps I could get your thoughts. I mean, Anne mentioned there about getting the message to consumers regarding uh, what, what science is or isn't saying. Do you see any role there for, for wholesalers like yourselves or is this something that comes further down the line? Um, definitely, um, as, as being directly in the business, um, we are probably a bit distant from, from science um, for anything that um, we want to do and we want to, let's say, um, stress our producer to do when we are going to, to do some changes in our product or we uh, study any possible change on, uh, on product uh, reform, on product uh, composition and um, recipes, uh, we always have to have a look at uh, a science in the sense of uh, what is then going to be our product in the end. And um, science is also supporting um, innovation is what is, uh, is actually bringing us um, the future products that we will have in our stores. So we were talking about uh, plant-based products and uh, of course this is a, a great opportunity and a wonderful product to be, uh, to be uh, offered to the, to the customers. 
but definitely uh, what the uh, consumers, for example, if we take uh, some um, alternative uh, drinks, uh, what the consumer want is, is, is still a drink with, which probably in texture, in, in color, in uh, mouthfeel will be very similar similar to uh, to milk, and therefore here where it comes to uh, innovation, so uh, the the production uh, process, uh, what is the best method to produce this product in order that the final product will be uh, accepted? So science and any organization which base will be always uh, supporting us in research, in development, in innovative uh, products. Not only us, but of course the the producer who are um, delivering us the the final product. Thank you. Emma, did you want to come back in on any of these points that we've been discussing? Sure, yeah. I, I'm sorry, my, my stream cut out a little bit, so I missed some of the uh, discussion, but I heard that um, there was reference to the confusing messages sometimes reported in the media. Uh, and maybe I could just mention that in general, there is an issue of consumer confidence and consumer trust um, because even though the EU food law says that uh, information given to consumers must be um, must be accurate and credible, uh, there's a great number of grey areas where food companies sometimes um, uh, skirt around the edges of what is uh, accurate. Um, and we find that in many countries, consumer, um, so 85% uh, and 84% of Dutch and German consumers do not trust what's on the label. So I think that points to a wider issue of uh, consumer confidence in, in how um, food information is, is conveyed uh, to them. Our action focused on um, misleading food labeling uh, practices such as uh, fruits on the front of the pack when actually there's only a few drops of fruit uh, juice in the product, um, artisanal or traditional products which use additives and uh, whole grain products which are uh, very, have very little uh, whole grain. Our Spanish member found a biscuit which was advertised as whole grain but you would have to eat 25 biscuits of uh, or 25 cookies of this biscuit brand to get the same fiber um, or amount of fiber as an apple. So these kinds of um, uh, we call them tricks of the trade, uh, really don't uh, engender consumer confidence. So we would really like to see a more honest approach uh, towards consumers in general. Thank you, Emma. Um, let me turn now to another question from our audience. And Christine, I think perhaps you would be well placed to answer this. The question is, what is your view on advertising self-regulation? I think man, this 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 question is discussed actually at the at the farm to fork strategy. Um, uh, I think self regulation not really function in the in the past. Uh, we need more education. We need more information for the consumer, and then we need uh, regulation about labeling that the consumer that was informed and that all the information he on the front of uh, of the uh, all the food stuff so i think uh, not too many regulation on the one hand uh, but some things we do all over the the european union i don't support uh, a ban um, in all ways because i think it's very important that the consumer understands and it's not um our uh, uh, our function as politicals to say someone what he should eat or what he should drink our uh, thing is to say when you drink this and when you eat this these are the consequences so i think on the one hand education is very very important and then we need uh, mandatory nutrition labeling all about the european union that not uh, every country has other labeling and if you go to other land you don't understand it i think that's uh, that's the right way to go thank you what's your view on self-regulation in that area certainly um yeah i think i think uh, it's a really crucial topic and it's something that um we work on a lot in in believe that self-regulation unfortunately hasn't delivered um, the results that are necessary to protect um, children and adolescents who are vulnerable consumers uh, who are especially vulnerable to the the marketing um, 
messages and techniques which are which are used um, especially in the digital age um, because these kind of marketing techniques tend to be um, very uh, subtle but no less persuasive and uh, what we find with self-regulation is that uh, the rules tend to be very very weak so in Europe we have the EU pledge which continues to allow uh, very sugary biscuits, ice cream, crisps to be uh, advertised to children, which they define themselves as um, under 12 years old. When we know that teenagers, uh, that's a, a key demographic uh, for, for marketing strategies, they are also vulnerable um, to, to, this, uh, to these marketing um, techniques. Um, so we would really like to see uh, a much stronger um, regulation of marketing to children uh, rules, which protect children and teenagers. Um, that has a much stricter um, approach in terms of what is defined as uh, healthy enough to be advertised to children. And also, um, we need to make sure that we we cover uh, the exposure and power of of uh, marketing strategies on TV, but now on on digital uh, platforms. So social media, Instagram, influencers. TikTok, all these avenues are being used to, to advertise uh, unhealthy products to children, unfortunately. So we really need to step up our game in terms of protecting uh, these vulnerable consumers. Thank you. Stinica, perhaps you could add something to this discussion as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. I, I was listening to the conversation and then I, you know, earlier in this conversation, we said public education is extremely important. And then I also heard saying something about the level playing field is very important, but we spoke about level playing field for, for businesses or industries. And then combining this with the discussion about, about um, marketing and self-regulation, we need to put these things into perspective. Um, I don't have the exact numbers here, but it's so easy that if you have a public education campaign to bring that completely, to undo it completely with some marketing, uh, for unhealthier uh, foods or uh, sorry unhealthier products so I believe that I, I agree that self-regulation has a limited yeah it's, it's core perspective also um, looking at the funds that are available for the, the several messages that could go out so I, I really there is a strong role for regulation um, the public sector, the government should put in place some rules and regulations within which that marketing uh, could take place. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, we talked a bit about regulation and so on and, and, and possible uh, reform, but and the farm to fork. But Christine, perhaps you could tell us what we can expect in the future in this policy area. Mm, at the one hand, about uh, um, other things about food labeling, we discussed in the farm to fork strategy, strategy about the uh, nutrition labeling, and on the other hand, about the ecological footprint labeling and the regional labeling and animal welfare. I think uh, that uh, stones uh, 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 very very important things. Uh, to give the information for the consumer that he can decide what uh, he or she is uh, she's eating. So, um, on the one hand, a lot of things about labeling. On the other th thing, on the other side, the the reduction about pesticides, about fertilizer, uh, and all these things to to make our um, uh, food uh, more sustainable, and uh, the the food su supply chain and uh, uh, the third thing I can only repeat with this cut about is uh, uh, the education, the education and the, and the inform information beginning in the kindergarten over to, uh, to the school and to the whole society. And I think these are the, the, the very important uh, thing to reach. Um, we also, also have to, to make decisions about food waste at the moment too many food uh, goes in the bin and that's not uh, that's not okay on we have to discuss if the price is uh, is the right way or also uh, the the thing to to make it clear for the consumer and when the, if we discuss in in the in on political level for a lot of country in the European Union the food price is very important and some of the discussions said it at the the beginning 
we have to think how we can uh, support the sustainable and the best uh, food in form of prices about uh, taxes, about lower taxes. Um, but I think that's, that are decisions in our member states. But we, we discuss it now on the political uh, level. So on the one hand, labeling. On the other hand, education. And the third thing to discuss about food prices, that the sustainable and the best food is the, is the cheapest. Uh, because a lot of consumer has decided over money. And so we have to look very, very careful to the price. Thank you. I'm just interested to know, do you think that people's and policies towards healthy eating versus obesity and so on, and taking into account that we need a sustainable and resilient food supply chain have changed because of the pandemic? And perhaps I could get your thoughts on whether you think there's been a shift in, in general in people's thinking. Yes, I think there has, uh, at least in, in many people's thinking, because it's so evident that obesity, well, people with obesity or overweight were more at risk when they achieved, but also because of our way of living during the corona uh, pandemic, we are more sedentary, as someone already said, less physical active, and maybe you snack more because you're bored. So, so the whole thing has been uh, raising awareness, I think, in the public view, but also in, in the among policymakers, so it's become a higher priority to to make people uh, more eat better and move more to reduce obesity and overweight. And in the end, it saves Thanks. money. Okay, <laughs> Valentina, have you noticed any shifts or changes as a result of the COVID pandemic? Uh, well, from our side, um, I cannot really judge whether there was a change from the business perspective in terms of choice so from the customer um, uh, choice and uh, direction uh, of course as you can imagine uh, as we are a uh, wholesaler we were heavily affected by the fact that um, uh, business were closed for, for a really long time and therefore um, we had to take some measurements in order to um, go through this, uh, this situation and uh, luckily we are uh, close to see, let's say, uh, a normality also in, in, in our businesses, in our, in our um, stores, and in our location uh, all over the 34 countries. So I cannot really say whether there was a really a difference in terms of um, in the tendency where the customers were going, which product we're selecting and buying. The same question to you then, on whether you think there has been a, a change or a shift uh, precipitated by the COVID pandemic? Um, I think though it comes back to the food environments as well, the, the question of food environments. There was more awareness maybe from consumers, but they were still making their, um, their food and beverage choices within a food environment, which still pushed them um, towards unhealthier um, food uh, choices. So the, the sort of the nutritionally poor uh, foods, which were, um, which consumers are increasingly pushed to, to, to buy, uh, that remains the same uh, situation now. Um, what we have seen is maybe some um, governments taking uh, action. I know in the UK recently they announced a 9pm watershed for, for marketing to kids uh, for the TV and then an online ban on paid for advertising. So I'm hoping that this marks the start of a shift towards governments um, taking more action to to regulate the, the the food environment to make it healthier for for consumers, but also especially for children who we know um, were spending so much more time on screens. So they were um, socialising, they were being educated, uh, they were using screens for for leisure time with like gaming platforms and so on. All this means that they were probably more exposed to digital marketing. So we really need to remember that yes there maybe might have been more awareness raised but unless we tackle the uh the causes of an unhealthy food environment um we will see probably uh, little effect unfortunately thank you and stinica has this the pandemic changed anything from your perspective um what sort of work is UN nutrition doing and, and has it been altered or has it been a, a shift because of the pandemic Thanks. Um, 
thanks for the question because last year we did indeed a, a questionnaire asking consumers worldwide if they if there were any changes in their consumer behavior and there was an interesting outcome there so indeed there was much more awareness as was uh, as emma also mentioned already but there was also much more home cooking specifically in the in the european area and and that is interesting because that awareness linked with home cooking um, creates a lot, lot of opportunities for yeah behavior consumer behavior you're more aware of what are the ingredients for a meal for a healthy meal uh, you're more also we, we found out that consumers are more aware of where the food is coming from and how vulnerable the supply lines can be even though at least in Europe, we, we were fine. You still saw that consumers were worried about where does the food come from. So people were more conscious about uh, buying their foods closer to their homes, shorter supply lines, to supporting uh, local suppliers or local producers. And I think that's also a very important element. And it links a little bit back to our uh, back to what we said earlier in the conversation uh, when you asked. Uh, sustainable healthy diets that is is an upcoming topic and i believe that has been really uh pushed i hope uh, a little bit by the by the covid pandemic so that consumer awareness in combination with more resilient food systems more sustainable food systems that should become more visible and tangible in the food environment i really hope that is something we are going to let's say win from the pandemic thank you and i'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat we won't go through them all now but i just want to thank our audience for being so engaged uh, a lot of comments agreeing with with most of what you are saying but we've just a few minutes left so let's get a final round um, of comments from everyone just telling me on what your expectations or hopes are or your final message christine i will start with you um uh, thank you so much i want to 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 say something to the last question about the pandemic because i can agree agree a lot uh, what the others said uh, but i think uh, the COVID um, has made many people realize that uh, we need to pay more attention to uh, to our health and i think that's a, a very important thing so uh, uh that many people really looked what happens with their health and how important a sustainable diet is for our health and on the other hand that the work of our farmers is so important then that we have to be in independent in the european union uh in, in in food production that we can produce our own food in the european union and i think that's that's very important for the future and on the uh, other hand, uh, um, I always can can repeat education, education, and education. And um, with our decision, when we go uh, to buy our food stuff, we decide how agriculture will look. And for this, we need the education, and we need the labeling that the education um, comes to the consumer and that he can decide. And the last point i want to point out um, we can put a lot of information on the front pack but not all information so for me it's very important to get a digital solution it can be a very good uh, um, uh, chance for our for our food producer Stinica, can i have your closing thoughts what's your final message Yes, thank you. I I really liked it. Conversa liked the conversation also because it it more and more went to the direction um, not just of of specific foods, but rather of the entire diet, and not just a healthy diet, but also a sustainable healthy diet. That is, I believe, where we need to go. So, how can we make sure that the food environment in where we pick the foods that are part of a sustainable healthy diet? is as enabling, as facilitating, as it, it can possibly be to, to facilitate consumers to make those good choices. So sustainable, healthy diets that are good for, for healthy people, but also for the, for the environment, the planetary health. And I believe that our, our governments, um, also regional governments like the EU, need to 
work towards that goal and make it possible. Of course, supported by solid evidence, what constitutes a healthy diet. Perhaps um, if you can hear me, Emma. Yeah, I, I think I can just uh, echo that point that um, what we would like to see is, is public health um, authorities really in the driving seat um, to bring in the kind of um, policy tools, effective policy tools, which have been proved to work um, that can help consumers uh, when they're in the supermarket choose healthier or more sustainable consumption um, last year, which found that two thirds of consumers are, are willing and open to change their eating habits for uh, environmental reasons, for example. But um, at the same time, only 16% of consumers were happy with um, the actions that their governments were doing uh, in this in this area, and they, they need uh, more help to be able to help to be able to choose a more sustainable uh, options. So I really welcome that we've had this conversation about food environments because I think it's a it's a good indication that there's a recognition that it's not just one. Um, one reason behind um, the issues that the food system uh, is facing and we really look forward to the the implementation of, of some of the the key uh, policy tools in the farm to fork strategy uh, including the front of pack nutrition labeling which MEP Schneider also mentioned and um, also decide to take uh, further action on uh, marketing to children thank you thank you Emma and Valentina your closing remarks please Definitely for us, it's, um, it's key to have this look at uh, what is the challenge, what are the challenges um, from a business perspective. So uh, we are definitely in favor of, uh, as I said also previously, of a harmonized way of, of labeling across uh, at least European countries uh, to allow the, the consumer to have a clear we are providing on our product as well as also um, to stress again our effort in, in uh, several, in being committed in several policies uh, across different topics on sustainability, on health and nutrition. So our uh, work that we are uh, constantly on a daily basis doing uh, together with our suppliers and producer, and, and of course um, with all the stakeholders involved, in uh, making the products uh, healthier and available um, on on our in our stores, of course the the challenge on the price, which was also raised uh, during the discussion, is uh, is very important to to tackle. And um, for us, it's not only the price but also availability of uh, raw materials. Um, as well as uh, really the, the, the eye on, on the final uh, quality and final result of a reformulated product. So um, two points more, uh, digitalization is, is key, as it was also said uh, during the discussion. So we are very in favor of uh, working on making uh, information available also on a digital base and as well as trust. So how we can build trust is of course giving transparency, giving uh, the right information, and uh, we are uh, working internally um, constantly to have all the information needed for our customer and everything track. Thank you, Valentina. And finally, let me turn to you. What's your last message that you'd like to leave our audience with? Thank you very much. I, I very much agree with what has been said, uh, especially by Christine, regarding information, education for children. It's really important. Each country has a big uh, responsibility, of course, because you can only do so much on an EU level. So that's really important. And uh, finally, I would, I would just uh, emphasize again the SWEET project, which is uh, going to show some interesting results, I believe, in, in about two years' time as an example of how we can change a diet towards something more sustainable and healthy, or at least that's, that's what I expect. So thank you very much. Very much, and indeed, ladies, thank you to all of you for an interesting and stimulating conversation today. Thank you to our audience and for your questions and your attention. This discussion has been supported by the International Sweeteners Association. Have a great day.